Just before we get into the main episode, a quick message from a friend of On Farm recorded in her tractor cab. Hello, my name is Katie Brisbane and I am a project coordinator for RET, the Royal Highland Education Trust. We work to give children a greater understanding of food, farming and the countryside. This year we have a focus on the journey of food, seeds and grains, highlighting all the great things produced by Scotland soils. If you're a farmer or work in a rural business and you'd like to get involved to volunteer or sponsor our work, we'd love to hear from you. We also have a huge range of educational resources on the website. If you know any teachers or educators who might appreciate them, you can find out more at www.red.org.uk. Hello and welcome to On Farm. It's Anna with you again this week and I have been on my travels, thank goodness, because now that things are getting a little bit back to normal, we can get out and about. So I spent, albeit it was a very rainy and miserable day, but I spent a lovely few hours on the farm with Virginia Osborne uh, near Kiri Muir. Uh, Virginia farms beef and sheep organically in what I think was a very beautiful location, but it was a little bit too foggy for us to see exactly what was going on, but had a really lovely chat on a whole range of things, and I hope that you enjoy it. I'm Virginia Osborne Antelovey, and I farm here on my parents and my brother and sister all together on our family farm. We've got 105 suckler cows, we've got a small flock of pedigree clean sheep as well as some commercial sheep and we are very much wanting to do nature friendly farming. We're 1100 acres and we are on the edge of the Cairngorm National Park, at one side going over to the Vale of Strathmore on the other and the Angus Glens. By pure unlucky accident, I have chosen to come here on a really miserable day. (laughs) We're in a cow shed because otherwise we'd be absolutely soaking wet. It's foggy, it's raining, it's quite cold. So I can't see the lovely views, but you were telling me about them when I arrived. So can you just tell me a little bit more about physically, if if people were standing here on a sunny day, what would they see? Yeah, I mean, we're really fortunate because it is extremely beautiful here. I think Angus as a county is very underappreciated for what a beautiful part of the world it is and how much it has got to offer. So, I mean, the view over that highest point of the farm is 1,100 acres at Mile Hill. And from there, you're looking over to Catlaw, which is lovely and a sea eagles flying over it and then we've got view to Shahalian. then you look down the Vale of Strathmore you can see t- across to Dundee and further afield then we've also got the Angus Glens just just on the other side of us as well so I mean it's a uniquely beautiful part of the world I feel and as well our where we are in the world and topography of the farm we have got a tremendous variety of habitat on the farm which is really nice we've got very high up organic arable fields we've had organic potatoes here before but i think we're we're at the very top (laughs) we're 700 feet at the farm gate and where we are standing now would be about 900 Mm -hmm. but then you know we're right up onto the hill as well so we've got a tremendous variety of habitat and it's really beautiful but funnily enough when we actually we've been here for 20 years now and when my parents bought it we came on a day like this. Oh, did you? <laughs> we did. So I was like, oh, it must have been the view that sold it. But actually, no. It can't have been because I can see a view at the moment. But I do. No. It, it's weird. Like, you can kind of sense a view, yeah. even though you can't see yeah. it. You know, you can feel the elevation. Yeah. And when I was lower down, I could, I could see the very wet, yeah. currently very wet beauty of the area. But it is lovely. And, and the farmhouse is set up quite high. So it must just have yeah. wonderful views on a well, good day. That's it. And I, I still remember I came with mum first time and we drove through it. And you could just see that it was a really good livestock unit and that you know this was a place that cows could coexist very happily alongside the habitat here so and we probably will talk about the cows in terms of livestock first because we're standing right next to them but just before we do that you know you said 20 years ago yeah um you came on a really wet day but what brought you all here in the first place on that really wet day well my parents started off we uh, my mum um, historically was um, uh, came from a tenant farm near Canusi in the, in the north of Scotland oh, yes. so that's where um, mum started out and then mum and dad farmed together and all of my life they farmed and my brother, sister and I all went to university and studied law 
and have gone into different areas within that. But ultimately, we all take a very active interest in the farm and have come back to the farm in some way, shape or form. While we were at school, my parents bought a farm that was a very intensive unit Mm -hmm. near Edinburgh. Um, So we had suckler cows there as well, but we had um, very good infrastructure in terms of sheds. The cattle were inside. We were using a lot of fertilisers. We were probably using a fair bit of pesticides. We were getting up to three cuts of silage off the fields and taking in a little bit of, of winter grazing for the cows over the summer. But my parents had always intended to move on from that system, but it was just, you know, we were all at school and so once we moved on and were on to university, it had always really been their intention to get something more extensive that wasn't yeah. so intensive and wasn't so dependent. I mean, it wasn't the way my parents had been farming previously. You know, the way that they had farmed when we were up north had been very much in keeping with nature and um, and and the environment. And this was quite a culture shock to go mm. and spend 10 years on this intensive system. So we had always really intended to move on And then the opportunity arose and we liked the area that we'd been in. We moved to near Edinburgh and we liked that area and really we hadn't considered Angus and it was just, it came up and once we saw it, we, you know, it was just instant really. We just thought, oh, you know, if only we can get that. Even on a rainy day. Even on a rainy day, I know. I can still still actually remember sitting in the house with my mum and opening the perspective for Conclune and seeing it and just thinking, oh, that looks amazing. Wow. So and, yeah. and we managed it and we've been very happy here and the long term plan now is that this continues on in our family mm-hmm. and that um, the three children together with my parents now right, yeah. are partners in the farming business mm-hmm. so that's been a development and that we really want to shake things up now and there's been a period in agriculture where policy has driven us down a certain route and that hasn't always been you know, been actually the best route and and the way forward. And now things are coming back and there's been a realisation first that we needed to be more sustainable. But now it's a really exciting time in agriculture because people are actually saying, well, we we want to reverse declines in things like Mm. biodiversity and really contribute to, you know, the, the benefit of the environment. And cattle and sheep can play a role in that. Livestock farming can play a role in that because... The habitat and the environment that we have now here today is not the same as 100 years ago. And we have some wonderful biodiversity and a lot of it is coexisting with the livestock that we have on the hill. But well, actually, I say, you know, 100 years ago, 100 years ago, the way that we were farming, in some ways we're going back towards that now in a positive way. Yes, and that's come up a lot actually in recent podcasts, which is is interesting. It's kind of back to grandparents' generation or for some people, a generation before that. Yeah, Yeah. and that's where farms like ours really fits into the um, picture, I feel, because... We have an emphasis at the moment, which I find slightly worrying, which is to move land away from agricultural production and into other land use change. Now, that is sometimes appropriate, but it's not always appropriate. And ultimately, there's a lot of humans on the planet. There's an increasing population and we need to feed them. Yes, we need to feed them. Yes, and if we go for pure efficiency farming and supporting big farming, big efficient farming... And then having other parts of the land move towards rewilding and supporting biodiversity. I just feel that's a real missed opportunity and not correctly understanding that we need to get the biodiversity working everywhere and we can't just offload our environmental and biodiversity responsibilities. So what we see our place and the family farm's place is really working with nature and the environment and having the livestock alongside that and bringing in those benefits. So every inch of the country should be benefiting biodiversity and we should be using our livestock for that. Uh, yes, uh, totally. And, and it's interesting because you are an organic farm here, but you haven't yet mentioned the word organic. And I yeah. think that's really interesting because it's becoming very much the narr- narrative that organic farming is an incredibly important part of the farming system. But actually what people are saying at the moment is it's about regeneration and sustainability. And that was obviously your or- original motivation. Yeah. And then you went through organic conversion. So yeah. um, I find that really interesting. And I wonder if you could just kind of tell me a bit more about the thought process of the family as you went through this whole journey yeah well when we came to conclude really then 
the step into organic was a very natural progression because as you quite rightly say I mean it, it was a system that worked very well with nature and you know that was always going to be a good fit for us and the organic farming is a terrific way forward I mean the benefits that that bring you know we feel in relation to our bird life in particular that non-use of pesticides and non-use of fertilizers I mean we have got great soil health we've got great organic matter in our soil and then we've supporting wonderful invertebrate life mm. and that in turn is helping all these birds you know it's teeming with waders over the back also, I mean, you know, in terms of our costs and our inputs, it's a huge benefit that we're not doing that. You're making the soil work better, the nutrient balance is better, the water infrastructure is, infiltration is better. So the organic is a really important part of it. But then I will also say that this kind of farm, whether it be organic or not, this kind of upland grassland grazing unit can work very well for nature without yes. being organic but we do feel that the organic is a real added bonus to mm. it and really helps that invertebrate life that comes yeah. through into the yeah. into the system i've got so many questions i want to ask you so i almost don't know where to start um, <laughs> already i can tell that you're hugely knowledgeable about this um but you didn't by the sound of things study this at university like many farmers would tell me that they had you know oh i went to college and i did agriculture or whatever you studied law so i suppose the first of many questions is have you studied on the job you know how how have you learned all of this i know you've you know you've you've grown up on farms but um that there's a huge amount to learn and yeah. not just in terms of practice but science as well yeah. and I, yeah. I'm really curious as to how you've kind of taught yourself or where you've learned everything yeah well you're learning all the time so you know all of us read up on new systems there's some excellent books on soil health and regenerative farming my sister and I completed a regenerative farming course probably about a couple of years ago and um, that was you know quite an eye-opening thing in terms of what we could be doing really looking at how we can enhance the environment that we're in and work with the livestock. I mean, it, there is so much to learn. You know, we, we are constantly learning. Con and it's been a really good time as well in agriculture. I mean, there's been so much negativity about yeah. farming and yeah. about livestock, but the industry has really responded to that and is moving forward in such a positive way. There's a lot of collaboration. There's a lot of help out there. You know, so attending meetings that are educating farmers about how we can be doing things better and how we can be, you know, working with with our farms and making our farms more productive and more profitable, but also actually benefiting the environment and biodiversity and reducing carbon. Mm -hmm. And without wishing to be too nosy, you can tell me to my way of business. I'm also a little curious because you could be and, and might have been leading a very different life in a big city as a lawyer, probably, I don't know, but probably making more money. But this is the life that you've chosen and the life that your siblings have chosen. And I'd love to know what it is that really draws you to it and, yeah. and why I'm standing here talking to you today. Yeah, well, my brother, he still works in the city, to be fair. Right. Um, but he is he's very much involved in the farm and he loves it. My sister worked in law. Um, she worked as a university lecturer. Ultimately, she's got a PhD in, in environmental law wow. um, yeah. mm. and I had the briefest of city careers <laughs> <laughs> along with my mum actually she did the same oh, as really? me Gosh, wow. so we both qualified as solicitors and yes. um, although I enjoyed law actually I have to say I very much enjoyed studying it I enjoyed my degree after a short city career you know having the opportunity to come home mm. and work on the farm we farm you know it was it was just too great an opportunity to take and we feel I mean Farming is a way of life and we feel very privileged to be able to do it. You know, it has so many benefits for the community, for refeeding, you know, the support money that comes into a farm feeds back into the mm. rural community. I mean, if you look at a local rural community, I mean, it is completely dependent on agriculture. You know, everybody who lives in a rural town is in some way, you know, yes, supported yes. really uh, by by. Well, yeah population from not just in terms of what we eat which is the obvious one but in terms of everything the environment that people the countryside environment that people enjoy when they go out for a walk at the weekend everything yeah so much yeah i know i mean just the schools and the people who work in the towns 
in a rural community. I mean, it, it nearly all comes back to agriculture. Mm. So we do feel incredibly fortunate to be able to do this. You are a land manager, you know, you are managing this piece of land and this habitat. And it's really important that we have the knowledge and the expertise to do that well mm. and um, the support to do that well. Since we're in here, perhaps we can talk about the cattle and, and the system and what yeah. you do and, and why you do it. Yeah, I just love it inside the cow shed. It's such a peaceful place. You know, when, when we're into carving, we don't actually carve them inside. They carve outside, but there'll be some inside. And we do obviously check the ones inside nice and early just in case we've missed somebody who's yes. coming close to it. Yes. And it's just so lovely to come in here very early in the morning and the cows are all sort of mulling around snoozing uh, it's just a very very peaceful place yeah to be. It, it is because uh, you know they are literally chewing the cud here um <laughs> because it's a cold damp day you know we can see all the hot breath coming out and they do just look just look happy and relaxed yeah. don't they yeah. um and i guess that's what it's all about is giving them the nicest possible yes. life but in order then to also produce the best possible yes. product yeah. i mean i'm fascinated by it anyway but I suppose particularly in an organic sense that the sort of the meat eating debate you know I'm married to an arable farmer so the only people he actually feeds are vegans yes. um, so you know he's kind of happy about that but you know when it comes to the kind of the meat eating thing why, why would you encourage people to eat a fantastic beef stew that's come from your one of your organic cattle over you know going down the road to the nearest cafe and having smashed avocado yeah. on toast you know the, and, and we're not here to, to talk specifically about veganism but I think in the organic conversation it's really important and to yeah. hear from you your perspective I feel it's really important people have choice and firstly I completely respect people who don't want to eat meat or want to be vegan I mean that that's a choice absolutely and that's and completely I to totally yeah. agree with you completely up to them but what I think is really important is to have educated consumers and that is a good and exciting thing about this time because consumers are becoming increasingly educated mm. about where their food comes from so I mean firstly in relation to the smashed avocado and Scottish produced upland grazed pasture fed beef what I would say is be aware. Don't compare your avocado with beef that's been fed on soya. Compare mm. it with cattle that are grazing the hills of Scotland that are supporting biodiversity. I mean, if you planted trees all over this farm, you would decimate wader numbers yes. in a really detrimental way. You know, we've got superb habitat here for birds and the cattle work just brilliantly in balance with those wading birds. We've got red-listed skylark. I mean, they're always sitting in a hole in the ground made by a cow footprint. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so wow. it works. You can just really... imagine it, can't you? You can picture it. So, so yeah. it is about consumers educating themselves. And, you know, we've got to, you know, provide, we've got to be there and be accountable and provide that product and say this is what we're doing to mm -hmm. enable the consumers to be able to do that. But it is about the consumers educating themselves and making good choices. And one thing that's been very disappointing in media is this broad brush, eat less red meat. I mean, as beef farmers, we actually don't eat an awful lot of red meat. But as part of a balanced diet, mm -hmm. you know, and a, a, a diet, you know, a source of protein, a good healthy source of protein that you can get that can have, I mean, you know, we're carbon auditing, we're very low on, on our carbon footprint. Largely that will be thanks to being organic. We've got, you know, in the organic system, you have very low stocking densities, no um, chemical fertilizers. No pesticide use, you know, so we're performing very well from a carbon perspective within the organic system. You know, this is an excellent product that people can, can use. I think it's important that the public understands that farmers, as a generalisation, really care about their livestock. You know, we mm. spend our entire lives working with live animals and ensuring that they are happy and healthy. The part where they go into the food chain is the very end of their life and it's very short and we have a lot of faith in the abattoirs in this country that that is done as well and humanely and as responsibly as it possibly can be done. So their stress levels, you know, we try to keep those very low, try and limit mm -hmm. any upset to the animals. The most stressful thing that they will ever do would be 
transport and yes, going to abattoir yes. wherever possible i mean our sheep go direct to the abattoir our young cattle they come off their mums which you know is a stressful event but we do everything we can to minimize that stress event on them mm-hmm. um, in the way that we manage the weaning process and then they go to another organic producer and th- that's it that's the other move for the rest of the lives of those animals yes, and from yes. there then it is hopefully onto a local abattoir Mm-hmm. So that's mm-hmm. really an important thing. We've got very, um, in the organic system, very low uses of medication. And when we give medications, we're, certain medications we can't use at all mm-hmm. because, mm-hmm. Um, you know, for example, certain antibiotics that are being discouraged because yes. that could have an impact on human health. Um, also, anything that might damage the environment around us and the ecosystem. So, so certain drugs that might be detrimental to, to dung beetles, we can't use. And any medications we give our cattle have uh, or sheep have a double withdrawal period. So, you know, you can feel very confident when you buy an organic product that that is very clear from the inputs that have gone into that. Yeah, human safety and, and health is up most. Yes. yes, and yes. also the, they sometimes say that the worst thing that ever happened to sheep was humans <laughs> because we've bred <laughs> traits into sheep that are perhaps undesirable and that's the yes. way agricultural policy has gone in the yes. past. It's pushed yes. us down a road and that's coming back now. So now farmers are reducing, we're working very hard to reduce our inputs um, to be more profitable and more efficient but we're also breeding traits into our livestock that are better Mm -hmm. one of the um, breeding traits that I'm very interested in going forward is the lower methane production oh yes yeah so I mean if we can in Britain be producing a herd a national Mm -hmm. herd with a lower methane output you know what an achievement that would be for us nationally yeah yeah. you know so that's that's where you know we really need research and development to back up the industry you know individual farmers can do a lot of good but really we do need the investment in the research and development where the whole industry is brought up in level yeah and and that's just one example isn't it of the way in which despite what the media would have you believe the farming industry is doing everything it can to reduce its impact yes um ultimately we still have to produce food but projects like that and initiatives like that are enabling us to have a good story and a positive story to tell and I think that's really important yeah and then as as personally you know in our herd what we are doing which I mean a lot of people are doing is changing their cattle so they're going for smaller cattle Mm -hmm. and we've got some young stabilizer cows which is an excellent efficient maternal breed and also we're going much more down the Aberdeen Angus route as well both Mm -hmm. which work very well for us in the past we've had Solars which are lovely maternal cows but they're big so we've yeah. mixed up the genetics of our solar herd. So, you know, we're crossing our bigger solar cows to the AA bull and we're getting very nice crosses out of mm-hmm. that. And so we're really working on bringing the size of the suckler herd the, of the individual animals down and hopefully bringing the outputs down. I thought that was breakfast arriving for no. the cows, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Wood for the fire instead, is it? <laughs> yeah. Um, I suppose I'm curious, you know, even despite the weather, it just seems idyllic up here to me. And and again, I suppose, despite the the storms also. So some farmers listening might think, right, well, Virginia's running a great enterprise, it's sustainable, regenerative. But why did she specifically choose to go down the official certified organic route? And I suppose I'd love to hear more about that in terms of your family's decision making and why you did it and how you did it and was it painful was it joyful you know kind of a bit more about the process um i it certainly wasn't painful um i mean i do feel it was a terrific fit for this type of farm Mm. this upland produced beef cattle and sheep it just works very very well so it's a very positive step that we've taken and we really enjoy being able to say that we're farming organically we feel proud to say that we're farming organically we want to be regenerative we want to be beneficial we we don't feel that we should be farming and doing a little bit of mitigation on the side yes, we really want to turn to it on to its ethos. head yes, it is i mean yes. you know everything that we do on the farm we're thinking how does this impact the environment around us mm-hmm. you know and is there a positive or a neutral or a negative impact yeah. and we really want to get rid of the negative impacts altogether and you know use the cattle as a tool to enhance the habitats for things like the birds 
but at the same time you produce a wonderful product of organic red meat in this country that has low carbon and great credentials mm. for the environment and biodiversity it is ultimately that you are actually running a better business you are putting less in and you know hopefully getting just as much or better out i suppose put simply it sounds to me as though you feel as though you sleep better at night knowing yeah. that this is the way that you farm because yeah. it's the way that you truly believe in farming. Yes. Um, and that's whatever, whether you're a lawyer or yes. an accountant or something yeah. very different, you, you kind of want a job yeah. where you can sleep at night knowing that you're doing the right thing. Yeah, and it's a nice thing now because, I mean, this is something we've been doing for 20 years. But and sometimes, you know, you were on the outside, you know, being there organic farmer you know all there was all the conventional farmers and you were very much yes. you know n things didn't often apply to you because mm -hmm. you were organic whereas things are changing now Be being an organic farmer is becoming quite fashionable <laughs> <laughs> yes. like i can't believe it we're <laughs> you're ahead of we're, the curve, yeah. <laughs> we are for once so that that's a really nice thing actually you yes know. yeah so, you know places that have been so driven by productivity Mm. I heard actually now having to look at farms like us and say, you know, what can we learn from these farms that are not putting necessarily super high productivity at the top? Yes. But yes. saying, you know, let's look at, look at biodiversity. Let's look at the environment. Let's look at the soil health. Let's let's look at not using these detrimental inputs and, you know, see what we can get, what mm. benefit we can derive out of that. You've inspired another question in me there, actually. And I suppose since COVID, communities have become much more online. Before that, they were perhaps more in person. Um, but have, have you found that there is a strong community in Scotland and maybe even beyond of organic farmers um, that you can just have a nosy at or learn from or teach in some way? Is that... Is that kind of relevant to your business? Yeah, so SOPA has been very supportive over the years and they try to run events where we can go along and we can learn from our counterparts on other farms. Yes, and yes. So definitely, I mean, you've got to look over the fence and learn mm. from your neighbour. And that's, you know, in changing times that we have, collaboration with farms is so important to see what other people are doing and to learn. You know, you mustn't be doing these things in isolation because we ultimately won't do it as well as we could. We've got to learn from each other. And um, SOAP has been a, a very useful tool. I mean, we can always phone up the office and, mm. you know, ask their advice on things and they'll give us terrific guidance on what we could be doing. Uh, and hopefully <laughs> now that we're moving beyond restrictions, there can be more in-person events and you can actually go and, and just chat to other farmers and... Yes offer advice or, or whatever it might be um you mentioned earlier that as an organic farmer you used to feel as though you were kind of in the minority and a bit different yeah. you're also a female farmer obviously <laughs> um how do you feel about that have you ever felt as in the minority yeah i mean i would say there there's two sides to that on my own farm i very much just feel like a farmer i've had sort of you know, 14 years now of just being on the farm full time working away with my dad and dad just wants a job done. He doesn't care who does it, <laughs> yes. you know, so it's you just have to get on with it. And being a woman, you know, I'm a fit, strong woman. Yes, it's not, yeah. it's in no way, I don't think. I mean, it's sometimes handy to have a strong man around if something's beyond me, but really hardly ever mm. I would feel in that situation. Yeah. But there is sometimes when you go to, you know, larger meetings and stuff, I think it's changing. I think, you know, yes, it's changing. And yes. I also, and I there are a lot of people putting a lot of work into making it change. So it's good yes. that, that, that that's effective. That and it's very are. nice as well yes. because I've recently applied for some Lantra funding. So, oh, yes. Yeah, so that's good. very nice. Excellent. So I'm going to be doing some Lantra funding um, for um, wildlife in the Cairngorms and oh, identifying yeah. wildlife in the Cairngorms so that then we can come back and apply that to the farm. One thing that is important, I think, for farms like ours, mm -hmm. where we are trying to benefit the environment and biodiversity um, and be a family farm and benefit the environment, I mean, as I've, I've said, I mean, we need, we need support. We need to be able to produce an affordable product to the British public. Yes. And we need everybody in Britain to be able to afford it and not mm -hmm. just be a premium product for either export or, you know, better off families you know yeah, we want yeah. this healthy product to be available to everybody 
So um, we need support, but then we also, you know, we don't have a divine right to be here doing what we're doing. So we also need to make it work. So diversification mm. is a big part of, of what we need to do. So we are diversifying the farm. Um, my sister is very involved in the diversification aspect mm-hmm. of the farm. And um, we're looking into how we can um, bring more people onto the farm and share what we have more on the farm, but in a responsible way that won't harm the biodiversity and habitats that we have. So that's something that we're really focusing on as well at the moment. And by sharing, do you mean primarily with members of the public or with other people within the farming sector who are interested in learning what you do, or or maybe both? Well, both. So so earlier in the... um, well. Last, at the end of last year, we had a nature-friendly farm walk where we had a mm-hmm. really nice group of people come around and we showed them what we were doing and talked about what we were doing. And it was a very knowledgeable and interesting group of people came around and we were also learning from them. It's also been really interesting, you know, the importance of working with your neighbours. Yes, you know, it's, yes. farms cover a massive area mm-hmm. of land in Scotland. And yeah. if we team together in a collaborative projects, you know, that is so beneficial yeah. on, a, on a landscape scale to the habitats that you can create and it's been a really positive experience working with our neighbours so it's been a really rewarding experience and now the RSPB recognise that there is a real wader hotspot in Angus. Well yeah I mean collaboration and cooperation I think are probably the two two of the most important words in farming at the moment I think everybody's realising that you can't you can't do everything on your own and whether it's working with your next door neighbour or organisations yeah. like SOPA, RSPB, yeah. that's the only way to get things done, I think, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And then there's projects we want to do on the farm. So we have had a little help from one of the agricultural consultants Richard Lockett so mm-hmm. hopefully in the future we're going to with his support we're going to do a nature restoration fund again RSPB are super keen oh, on wow. that yeah. Um, yeah RSPB really kicked off the sort of the objective for the nature restoration fund and um, so we've got an area of wetland where we've got a canalised burn. All oh, right. <laughs> um, so the burn, basically, a stream has been put into a channel. Ah, uh, I see. Right. Yes. So we're going now with the hopefully with a nature restoration fund application, we are going to restore the natural, the natural meandering yes, pathway which is happening quite a lot across and Scotland, isn't it? re-wetting yes. an area yes. and you know we're now looking we've got two duck ponds on the farm that were for shooting now they're totally managed for wildlife so you know we're going to look at really improving the wetlands improving those mm-hmm. habitats and seeing how that can be of benefit yeah. So we're looking at lots of different sort of pockets of what we can do around concluding, you know, we're doing a bit more trees, a bit more livestock. I mean, actually, I mean, that's quite interesting. We put in hedging. Now, we thought, great, we put in hedging. Aren't we clever? But we put the hedging, you know, in hindsight, quite close to the waders. So right. we actually now have taken down an area of trees on our SPB's advice that was near the waders oh, okay. because that's just predator it, purchase. Yes, We've got yes. our nice rabbit fenced hedge through the, neighbor, <laughs> the the wetland area. Now we're collaborating with our neighbours. We need to make little pathways through the hedge oh, wow. so that yes. the chicks can go backwards and forwards between their nesting and their mm-hmm. feeding sites. Of course, because they're not going to respect a, a farm boundary. That's... Exactly. Yes, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's interesting by putting in that barrier with our neighbour now that we're working collaboratively with them we understand that we've got to open up the pathway from our farm to their farm yes for the birds so yeah it's really fascinating yeah really fascinating (laughs) and i love how you mentioned diversification and i thought oh well probably it'll be self-catering accommodation or whatever which it may well be but actually what it is about is it's kind of different to a lot of people it's about finding different ways to tell the story of what you're doing not in a oh look how great we are kind of way but just in a you know this is what can be done and these are some examples of of what we are doing and by working with the RSPB you can actually demonstrate the positive impact that you're making and people really want to hear about that you know agritourism is increasingly popular but it doesn't have to be about you know riding a quad bike or doing something particularly high adrenaline it could be just learning about what's happening with with bird species and nature I mean a lot of it is reactive to all the negative press that there has been you know Mm. this sort of brandishing beef as you know if you just reduce your beef consumption just reduce your red meat consumption that is the golden bullet to fixing the climate Mm. and biodiversity when I mean it just couldn't be 
you know, from our experience and an organic system and Scottish produced livestock on grass fields, I mean, we didn't relate to that impression that was being sold in the media. And it's been reactive to that. You know, we've said, well, yes, we can do self-catering accommodation and we're, we're diversifying. We're going to do an events venue on the farm oh, wow. together with self. So we've, we've got mm-hmm. a Victorian steading. We've a, a listed house that has tremendous views across. And next to that, we've got the Victorian steading. And the Victorian steading, from a cattle housing point of view, really Not is very practical. No, anymore, it's, no, its days are are really <laughs> gone. So we're we're making that into an events venue with accommodation. But we also have, with working with RSPB and more organisations and more collaboration, mm-hmm. and realising one that we have this wonderful wildlife, and two how much other people appreciate it. Yes, Feeling that'll be breakfast arriving that, now. That is it? breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, cows you can see they're all, they're all making a move. That's it here. Yeah. <laughs> Bacon and eggs. They love, they love a fresh bale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, realising, you know, how much people appreciate that and being able to showcase that here and yes. say, you know, we are yes. not producing this livestock on, you know, feedlots and trashing the environment mm. and trashing biodiversity. You know, come and see it. Come and yes. see it for yourself. Yes. So, I mean, it's about wildlife tourism, but it's also agricultural wildlife tourism. It's see, see how mm. all these rare species that we have on the farm. I mean, I think 60 to 70 bird species on the farm just in the last year have been counted. And then we've also got loads of red squirrels. Uh, we've got lots of pie martens. We've got osprey as, and polecats and... I mean, we just, we're so fortunate to have all this wildlife around us and it's, we can do better with the way that we're farming and we're learning how to do that now. But, you know, the way that we've been farming organically for 20 years has already set us off. Yes. We're in a great place to start from and then we're looking to build on that and improve on that yeah yeah and i think you know i'm always banging the drum i think more should be done at a higher level government level to tell all the positive stories about scottish farming yeah but at the same time everybody can do their bit you know we're trying to do our bit with the podcast and and you're trying to do your bit and actually if you add all those bits together and collaborate yeah it really does add up and yeah, yeah some of the media will still still choose to run the same old stories <laughs> you've got a friend here <laughs> they're very friendly she wants cow. in on the app yeah. <laughs> she had a good cow she had twins last year oh did she oh. you know people don't really appreciate you know actually how much farmers really appreciate their own livestock and the environment that we're working in you know we're working with these animals and we're working in a wonderful environment and mm-hmm. you know farmers care a lot about the environment they care a lot about wildlife they're very aware about wildlife one of the things that's been nice about working with RSPB as well is that they are extremely keen to harness the knowledge that the farmers have of and course, to, yeah. to use that they appreciate that actually as the boots on the ground we know what's going mm-hmm. on so it's been a really rewarding experience working well, for them because it works both ways doesn't it yeah so I suppose two, two more questions are kind of springing to mind. But conventional farmers, which I always think is a funny term. Yeah. Because, <laughs> anyway, but if they're, if they're thinking, oh, do you, do you know, I, I have wondered about going down the organic route myself, but I haven't done anything about it yet. Yeah. What would your message to them be, first of all? message to conventional farmers would be that the way the world is going now, the way things are changing, you want to be at the front of this movement. You want to be leading the way to really save our industry, you know, save the countryside as we know it. You know, I don't want to see all these wonderful herbivores that we have roaming around in Scotland vanishing Mm. in favour of Sitka spruce plantations and commercial forestry. So what I would say is, you know, you want to be at the front of that movement to say, you know, we can farm better in Britain. The food that we can produce in Britain can be pro the environment, pro biodiversity. And at the same time, you can be hopefully reducing your inputs and producing a product that will reward you at the end of the day. You know, other innovations we're really looking at, I would love to, to go down the route of the uh, the electric collars on the cows. Oh, yes, yes. yes. So we I'm are just reading about that the yeah. other week. Yeah. So we keep the cows graze every inch of our farm and benefit the habitat on every inch of that farm. And we rotate them round the farm. 
But, I mean, the, the collars, from a conservation grazing perspective, which we are really interested in conservation grazing, then that could be so beneficial. That's interesting. So just being able to give you full control over where they can graze and where, yeah. and based on that system, just makes life easier yes. and helps to achieve your yes. habitat goals too. Well, the organic farming and the low stocking density, the non-use of pesticides, the non-use of fertilisers, has enabled us to have great soil health and sward heights and that's been really key for us supporting the wading birds to this point and i mean a lot more bird life beyond that yeah i mean then you're really using your livestock as a tool as a conservation Mm -hmm. grazing tool Mm. and then the the carbon sequestering abilities Mm. of non-overgrazed grass you know know, compared to you know we're not the tropics our trees don't shoot up in no time we don't have rainforests and we're never going to have them you know there's parts of the world where trees would be much much more useful as a tool in capturing carbon than here Yes. in this country yes. grass can yes exactly do and a great job i know that's the thing that is that all of the media coverage is just so general with yes. no true understanding of what life is like yeah. in scotland and that i think that's the most infuriating thing yeah. but you know many people are doing what they can to yeah. try and tell that story and, and reshape the narrative that's going on i still have to be in my bonnet that more needs to be done but you've got such a great story here and i've learned so much actually just just speaking to you <laughs> um it's becoming a question that i ask most people who i speak to for a podcast because every time i'm really fascinated by the answer if i come back which hopefully i can yeah. in five <laughs> years time say what do you hope you will have achieved and what will be different to the conversation that we're having now in terms of what we think concluding will look like i think we really want to do more to improve and restore certain habitats that we have and we can definitely do that Mm -hmm. with this nature restoration fund and improving the wetlands i want to see more wading birds more successful chicks of curlews and lapwings and oyster catchers and red shank we need to do predator control because you know we have changed the ecosystem we are trying to manage the ecosystem on concluding that we've got Mm -hmm. the cattle and we're balancing the habitats all farmers probably want to achieve something that the consumer wants and that gives them joy to produce at the same time we want government to take the whole industry up Mm -hmm. a level and not just have certain people doing it with premium products. I mean, I want our good quality product to be available to all families. Yes. So I want the whole yes. industry to come up and us yeah. to do better as a yeah. whole industry. So if um, anybody in the Scottish government's listening, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to say to them? <laughs> I want to say that, you know, do not focus on land use change to such an extent. There is an amazing amount that we can do alongside agriculture. We have to produce the food somehow. So Mm. why don't we produce the food better and work with the environment? Why not support farms like ours, family farms, who are feeding the supports that we get back into the communities and that are putting in habitat restoration and benefiting endangered species and supporting biodiversity. You know, help us to farm well and to produce a fantastic healthy product and to make that affordable to all of the citizens that we have in the country. This has been brilliant. Thank you so much. It's been lovely to have you here, Anna. Thank you very much for coming and meeting me. No, it's been fabulous. (laughs) It's, It's nice. And thank you very much to the people of SOPA who do a lot of work to support us as well. Thank you. Virginia is is a very busy lady, so thank you to her for um, giving up a few hours of her time to speak to me. And it was really, really interesting and great to meet another female farmer. Speaking of women in agriculture, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the Be Your Best Self programme. It is a Scottish government funded programme supporting women living or working in agriculture to help them build confidence, enhance their skills, develop leadership abilities. And they are running cohorts in April, May and September. It's not a huge time commitment. It's a few sessions across the course of a couple of weeks, but I have been lucky enough to be involved in this uh, as one of the facilitators and um, have really seen the value that it delivers. So if you are a woman who works in any field connected to agriculture or if you know somebody and you know a female who works connected to agriculture, please do think about applying. It's totally, totally worthwhile and, as I say, delivering real value. 
the link is incredibly long, so I'm not going to read it out here now, but I have checked. And if you type into Google, Scottish Government Be Your Best Self Programme, then you will be able to find a link to be able to find out more information and to apply if you're interested in uh, attending. It's totally free. Um, So if you're accepted onto the programme, it doesn't cost you a penny. And we've had some really good feedback. So well worth looking into. That is it for us uh, this week. Thank you again for listening to On Farm. Please do spread the word amongst friends and family and um, we'll be back with you next week.